Please call me Georgie. Georgie, I sure wish you'd be as nice to your sisters and your brother as you are to your friends. <laughs> you are so nice to your friends, but your sisters and brothers, I wish you'd be as nice to them as you are to your friends. Love starts at home. And love then goes out like concentric, like you drop a rock and it, out it goes. And so it's my neighbors. My neighbors and the people that I work with, well, before I get to work, the people I drive on the highway with, the guy that pumps my gas, the, the, the girl that I want you to, and by the way, it really helped. It really helped that over these years, Ma, Lee and I have had three golden retrievers. I'm very, very sad, because our, our golden and our, and our little Charlie, who's a terrier, who is not quite as sweet as a golden, but he's very fun. Um, but goldens are the best, you know, the best, Goodwill ambassadors on the planet, okay? <laughs> Hi, I love you, I want to meet you, you know, and so the golden, and so if I'd had my pit bull, that would have been a little different, okay? Okay, just saying, but golden retriever out there meeting everybody, I'm meeting everybody, and I'd say, oh my, and I'd, 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 I would say, well, her name is Sisu, and, uh, and then that led to us exchanging our names, and I get to know people, and so uh, this has been one of these, these callings that I never knew, what God's called me to get to know and to love and to care for and, and to be a pastor too when I hear someone and we just, just what, a week and a half, two weeks ago to three doors up, we heard somebody's brother died and the little girl told us and so Lee went and bought a flower and a little card and went up and just said, hey, we heard your brother love like Jesus loves. That's our calling. Wherever you are, whoever it is that you interact with, whoever it is that the Lord brings you into touch with. So I'm walking one day and and uh, at that point, I guess I had my dogs, but I'm walking, and I notice, and, and, and by the way, there's other dogs in the neighborhood, and, and so, uh, anybody know what one of these is? <laughs> Fuck, I guess. I go, what? And uh, God has people he wants to save, and it's through loving like Jesus loves. Which, you heard I was going to come here and be an ADRA ambassador, which is why I love ADRA. Because God uses ADRA. By the way, what's ADRA stand for? A, Adventist. Did, a lot of people say, when I ask that, oftentimes I'll hear, Adventist Disaster and Relief. It's actually Adventist Development and Relief Agency. And the disaster piece is the piece. So that's the part we know best. The ADRA Development and Relief Agency, actually its work, 75% of what it does, of what ADRA does around the world, 75% is development. 25% are the disasters that we race into, like the most recent being those, those earthquakes, horrible earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, um, the war in Ukraine. But development is a piece that's, that's part, and this is just going in and loving like Jesus loves. So we're going to watch two short videos. They're like two and a half minutes, whatever. And the first one is from Cambodia. And this one from Cambodia is a picture of, of working for development in a village that had no water, no, no good clean water source, and no latrines. That's the first one. Okay? The second one will be a teenage girl with her mom and two siblings who had to... We didn't have a toilet. We used the bush around our home. My name is Tia Kong. I am 55 years old and I am from Cambodia. Seeing my children face these problems, I felt helpless. So we would drink any water that we could find. We got diseases, vomiting, diarrhea, coughing. We were taking traditional medicines as I didn't have money to go to a health center or hospital. Adra talked with me about raising chickens, growing veggies, having good sanitation, and building a good latrine. This made me feel hopeful. This project has been very important. Uh, it has changed their life. They have uh, received a lot of benefit from the project so far. The children get more healthy as well as hygiene and sanitation and a lot more. Since we received a latrine and a water filter, our family is better. I draw board change to my family.
Jesus never asked, who are you? What is your nationality? Are you a good person or a bad person? He was open. And I think this is a good example for us. When we are helping others, it's like Jesus, hands will be through us. We change because of Jesus, of his impact on us. And we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. A global humanitarian agency, ADRA, which is the Advanced Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, based here international. Right now, the organization has people in and around Ukraine, helping the hundreds of thousands of people flee. The groups here at home are getting involved as well. The Maryland A Group is going much farther, 5,000 miles farther, to provide direct help. It's already providing shelter to refugees in youth centers and church buildings. And her volunteers cross the border themselves into Ukraine this convoy carrying supplies. When they said, like, don't worry, you can feel like at home here and we will help you because we are your brothers and sisters in God. They just supported us and that meant so much. God's people said, I, um, I had the opportunity to actually meet the, the director, ADRA director there, a woman who, uh, her husband pastored a church right on the border with Romania and Ukraine, and she talked about how their church had every single, they had pews, every single pew had people sleeping on them for weeks. For weeks, they had people, and the people would come in. They'd be there for two or three days, try to work out where they're going to go, and the next wave would come through. And do in the church, I love that picture when it said, "For the church to be a sanctuary, a sanctuary where people can find that love and that support, where that love, like Jesus loves, becomes the whole purpose of the church and how we live out. Well, the purpose of the church: lift up Christ, but live the love of Christ, and to be able to make it uh, touch people's lives like this." Um, so what a privilege. Avenus Community Services here natural, nationally, internationally, uh, with ADRA and its work, both with development and with, and with uh, disaster relief. So, so here's my question, my question for the morning before we open the scripture. And my question, my question is simply this. We've seen through ADRA what it looks like to love like Jesus loves. And the question is, is this the gospel? Careful, this might be a trick question. Is this the gospel? Or is this the fruit of the gospel? Ah. Let's go to John. I mean, think about what verse would, 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 would speak the gospel if you use one verse in the Bible. John 3, 16. Let's, say, let's repeat it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the gospel. The gospel is always about what God has done for us in Christ. I love the fact that you have a cross in your church. Um, I go to so many churches, there's no cross. There's always an American flag, but no cross. And I go, huh? Okay, that's another issue. You can think about that. You don't, you, I don't need to preach that one to you because you have a cross in your church. But, but it's what it's saying is, look, the gospel is always about what God has done for us in Christ to bring salvation to the world, to each of us, and to, to, to the whole world. Not just us, but the whole world. So praise God. Has anybody memorized 1 John 3.16? Oh, back, back row, please. Um, in a song. Yes. Amen. And we ought to lay down our lives for the others, for the brothers and the others. In fact, I, let's go. There it is. Let's repeat it together. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for, uh, for the brethren and for others. Um, in fact, the next verse goes on to say in verse 17, and I don't know if I, if I asked for that or not, but in verse 17 it says, I'm going to read it to you here. 
Verse 17 says, um, let's see here, I'll pull it up. Because, okay, here it is. Verse 17 says, By this we know love. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So, I love this, that the, the way that they describe, the way they put the Bible together, the verses actually work here. John 3.16 is the root. It's, the God, it's what God has done for us in Christ. He gave His only begotten Son. Root and fruit, now watch this, root and fruit, always distinct, never separate. Root and fruit, always distinct. Because if we confuse it and get muddy, then we're thinking that our good works are the gospel. No, they're, they're, they can be good and be very helpful, like this lady in Cambodia and this family in, in Poland, but, but root and fruit, so we go always distinct, never separate. Go to our text for this morning. Our text is Matthew, uh, not Matthew, it's Micah, Micah 6, 6 through 8. And what does he say? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High, before the High God? Shall I come with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Let's go to our next verse. Verse 7. Can we go to the next verse? Can we go there? Verse 6, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? By the way, what we're looking at right here is the default religion of the world. It's the way the human psyche works. Wherever you go and whatever religion it is, what it says, it says, if I give this, then my deity owes me this. If I give enough of this, then you owe me this and you give this to me. And, and we have this transactional setup in our mindset of the way we relate to God. And this is what's being reflected right here. Micah's calling it out. Mike is going, so I give, and look how far it goes. This is heartbreaking when you take the next phrase. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? What's he talking about? Child sacrifice. Shall I, and by the way, we can't even comprehend. Can this be even possible? That, that right outside the gates of Jerusalem, and the Kidron down there, that there would be a temple to one, one of Solomon's wives that had a temple built to Moloch? who's there to receive the little ones on an angle with arms like this that would roll down to the grate with the fire? Are you, this, right? In, what? And Jeremiah, the Lord says, how do you ever imagine, you imagine that I asked, wanted you to do this? How could you imagine it? Shall I give my first, because people all around the world are going, if I really give the most valuable thing of all, then God has to answer. See, this picture, the fruit of my soul, body for the sin of my soul. Ah, oh, and what's the next step? What's his next state? Let's go to the next verse, and it's verse 8, which we know. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God? By the way, that statement is that root or fruit? Thank you. Thank you, brother, wherever that came from. It's fruit. And you know what? And I forgot to give this text to him, so I'm going to read it. It's right in Micah, and guess what it says in Micah 6, verse 4. 6, 4, and 5, just before this verse starts. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. Root or fruit? Root. I brought you out of slavery. Root. Now, because I bought you out of slavery, I want you to... No, don't come try to offer me. No, you now respond with live justly. Uh, walk just... I'm, I'm sorry. Love justice and walk... walk you know, I'm, I'm forgetting the text here. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. He said, that's fruit. So root is... I, by, by the way, what are the first words of the Ten Commandments? Thank you, sister. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Those are the first words of the Ten Commandments. The next word is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is all response to God's initiative in grace. This is the gift that he gives us. And this is what we're being invited to live, how we're being invited to live our lives. Now get this piece. If you want to have a quote, this is the one you want to take home today. If our religion is not the default religion of the whole human race, but we instead receive this counterintuitive, countercultural thing called grace that is revealed to us through God of the Bible and His Son, Jesus Christ, if we embrace that, then watch this. If our religion is grace, if our religion is grace, then the rest of our life is gratitude, which will bear fruit. If our religion is grace, the rest of our life is gratitude. And we go, you gave me this. Now I just go, oh. and by the way, living a life of gratitude is not a bad way to live. I mean, this is where the joy of the Lord comes to us. We're living with the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we're, we're living now in this gift of God that we're just going, what? Is this the really? Yes, God, I'm this good. I'm this good. Now, we've got to go fast. Um, this is in your bulletin, right? Everybody got this? These pictures, there's two pictures, one in the front, one in the back. And by the way, there are extras in the back. There's extras in the back for you. Um, but these two pictures, this first one, and even my eyes say, copyright 1876 by James White down the right. And here it is. It says, the way of life, paradise lost, paradise removed, restored. And so this picture, James spent lots of money, lots of dollars to, to hire an artist and to retain this artist and have him paint this picture to be able to take to the meetings and say, this sums up the Advent message. This is us. And this picture is based on Revelation 14, 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus. And they would take and they would share this at the meetings. And they'd say, here it is. This is what we're about at Seventh-day Adventist. Keep the commandments of God. Keep the faith of Jesus. And then it kind of got said this way. And if you'll keep everything the Father said to do in the Old Testament and keep, by the way, how many laws did the rabbis find in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, also called the Torah, but how many laws did the rabbis find and list out in the first five books of the Bible for God's people to keep? Thank you, 613. When Paul says in Philippians 3, according to the righteousness of the law, I was blameless, I was perfect, what he's saying is, I was checking off all 613. Now get ready and flat fasten your seatbelt. Skip McLarty at Andrews University makes the case the New Testament has more rules than the Old Testament. I had two brothers at church say to me, oh man, it was so hard in the Old Testament. I'm so glad we have the New Testament. Just two rules, love God, love your neighbor. And I go, really? Please, please go. You actually have more rules listed out. You know, the good news of Christ is told. And then Paul would say, okay, now do this, don't do this. All, and you put all that together. And then in the Seventh-day Adventist, we had some red books to that and more rules. And we go, oh, and if we do it all, then we get to go up here. There's a picture of heaven. Whew, how you doing? How you doing? Let me tell you something. This is amazing. And I didn't, this story is not known among us very well. But Woodrow Whitten, in his last book on Ellen White on Salvation, in the book, comes and brings a piece that he found in the, in the, in the archive, um, in the White Estate. And what he finds is, and he says, and she, Ellen herself, right, Ellen White writes this, and she says, on his deathbed, on his deathbed, James said to me, Ellen, Ellen, we gave them the wrong picture. I praise God for that. that. I praise God that James on his deathbed saw it and he shared it with his wife. What he recognized was is that he was reflecting the default religion of the human race. And because of that, 
By the way, thank you, Mo, for putting the pieces that you gave here on a nice cardstock. This is a keeper in your Bible. I always keep these in my Bible. But this is 1883 by Mrs. E.G. White. And now you have Christ the way of life. And Christ the way of life. And I've had people look at me and say, Pastor, the Ten Commandments over here, it disappeared. There's no Ten Commandments anymore. Hold it. Be with me here. Stay with me. Anybody see any, like, I know we see Adam and Eve, we see Cain and Abel, we see the sack. Oh, do anybody see a lightning bolt near a mountain back there? Whoops. That mountain, let me see if I can get this here. That mountain back there is Mount Sinai. But more than that, the man hanging on that tree is the one who said, I always do my Father's will. He's the living embodiment of the new covenant. And what is the new covenant promise from Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10? I will write my law on your mind so you'll know the right thing to do and I'll write it on your heart so you will get ready. Heart's the organ of desire. I'll write it on your heart so you'll actually want to do what, I, what you ought to do. I am never more free than when I want to do the right thing. That's the promise of the new covenant through the power of the Spirit is he worked to draw to go, I want to do this. I used to always put things on. Mom, one of my jobs was emptying all the trash cans on Friday. I'd put it off and I'd put it off, you know. My mom, you know, no, no. What, what, what if I actually wanted to do it? Go empty all the trash cans and then go, Mom, is there anything else I can do? Oh, can I help my sister? Whores, I would never do that. I'll help my sister do her chores. I mean, you know, ah, oh, this is the God's promise of what he intends, what he's doing in us through Christ, through the Spirit in our lives. Now, I don't know if this actually made it, Tim, to the, this piece called Christ the Way of Life. Oh, is it? It's going to be on the screen? We're going to read this, and you'll be on the screen, you'll see it. I'm going to read it very quickly, but I'm going to make the case, you know what? I, I don't know if anybody else has seen this. I believe that these words, that's why I've entitled it Christ the Way of Life. These words from Steps of Christ, page 62 and 63, are actually her verbalizing the painting that she had commissioned. She's verbalizing this picture. And these all happen very close to each other in a few years. Let me read it to you. The condition of eternal life is now just what it has always been. What is that condition of eternal life? Just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents, here, get ready. Perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. On my sheet, I've written 100% beside it. I don't know if you had a, is this in your bulletin as well? Okay, well, we, we'll make more, we can make copies for next week. Okay, thank you, Mo. So I've written 100% right next to it, 100%. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way it would be, wow. The way it would be open for sin with all of its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. Think about Cain and Abel. Lord shows up. Cain is lying dead. The Lord comes. He says, where's your brother? Cain goes. If Cain hadn't copped an attitude, like my, my brother's keeper. If Cain had fallen on his knees and said, oh, in a fit of anger, I murdered my brother. God, please forgive me. Would God have forgiven him? Amen. But then there's this other little issue. And the Lord says, I forgive you, Cain, but your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. I'm going to answer that blood with my own in the person of my son. By the way, don't ever see it as a three-party atonement. Cain murders his brother. God has wrath against murder. He says, what do I do? What do I do? I know I'll beat up my own son. Uh-uh. That's a lie. That is a lie. God was in Christ. These two are one. Cain murders his brother. God, he says, God, please forgive me. I forgive you. And I myself will take it in the neck in order to answer the cry for justice from your brother's blood. Two party, not three. That's crucial. Let's continue. Okay, by the way, here's the quiz question. How many say God forgives sins? This could be a trick question. How many say God forgives sins? 
How many say God does not forgive sins? God does not forgive sins. Watch this. God does not forgive sins. God forgives sinners. What does God do with sin? He makes atonement. This is the biblical gospel. This is the gospel in this book. If it doesn't go in harmony with this, it's a different gospel. Okay, let's finish this out. Next paragraph. It was possible for Adam, before the fall, to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. I've written again, 100%. I used to tell kids, I asked my classroom back at Tacoma Academy, okay, kids, what score do you need on your test paper to get into heaven? They go, well, an A is 94 to, you know, to 100, and it, because God grade on the curve, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Okay, okay, here it is. No, 100%. Ay, ay, ay. How in the world? Okay, here we go. But he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen. We went from being given glory to God to like focus glory to me. Okay, that's what happened to our nature. And we cannot make ourselves righteous. Cannot. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But, here he goes, hit, hit the table. But Christ, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials, temptations as we meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. He now offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us that in him we become the righteousness of God. So he died for us, take our sin, give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him, and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous, 100%. And all God's people said, and now this time we get to shout hallelujah. And all God's people shouted, hallelujah. Okay? We shout hallelujah. Wow. Christ's character stands in place of your character. You are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Wow. This really works in English. Justification, just as if I had never sinned. Justification is just as if I... These paragraphs, the first two, are about justification. By the way, great controversy. How many chapters does she include on Martin Luther? more than anybody else, has just finished reading Daubigny's History of the Reformation. Boom! But then, watch this, so Luther, of course, emphasized justification. But remember, Ellen grew up in what kind of home? What religion in her house? Methodist, Methodist, Methodist holiness. And so she's there. And so look at the next two paragraphs. More than this, Christ changes the heart. Okay, here comes John Wesley's influence. Martin Luther, John Wesley, and he goes, he changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith, continual surrender of your will to him. So long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Think about this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I go, oh man, how can I do? What do I have to do? He goes, I'm at work within you, at your, my spirit to yours, to say, even to even want to do the right thing. Every good impulse you and I have ever had, and every good impulse you've ever had in your life came from Him. Sourced in that Holy Spirit connection. We go, is there evidence of the Holy Spirit in the world? Every time you see something good, okay? He will work in you to do, will and to do, will and do according to His good pleasure. You may say, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So Jesus said to his disciples, it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father. I'm sorry, uh, I just lost my way. The spirit of your father which speaketh in you. The spirit is that intimately connected with you and me. The Holy Spirit is present here this moment in our hearts and our minds, engaging with every, every person you meet. The Holy Spirit is engaging. Then, with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit, do the same good works, works of righteousness and obedience, Final paragraph, summary statement. So we have nada. Nothing, zero, none of it of which to boast. We have no ground for self-exaltation. 
our only ground of hope is the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, his righteousness 100%, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are in the process of being made like Jesus, those who are learning to love like Jesus loves. We're, we live in the, and when I look at myself, I still say, oh, how can I ever be saved? When I look at him, I go, oh, how can I ever be lost? It's all about focus of attention, brothers and sisters. Focus of attention. I look at him. How can I ever be lost? Wow. Our groundly ground of hope is the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and that wrought by his spirit working in and through us. The clearest statement of the gospel ever written by an Adventist pen. You'll have a copy next week. We live in this. We become the people who are agape lovers. We are the people of hope. We are the good newsers that God now brings the light to shine in the darkness of our world. Let's wrap it up here. Um, and the wrap up is simply Matthew 24, 14. In Matthew 24, 15, it, it, the, this good news of the gospel will be preached to the whole, the whole world and witness to all nations. By the way, this is the message. The message I've just shared is the loud cry of Revelation 18. Sister White says, What's the loud cry that will go to the whole world and there'll be a great revival before the end of time? Christ, our righteousness. That's our message. We lift it up and we proclaim him. And is, boy, is our world hungry for this. They don't even know it, but they're hungry for this, for this Jesus.